So I want to start off with a, with a philosophical dilemma um, that uh, some of you may have heard, and here, here's how it goes. Uh, it's called the trolley dilemma. It's an old problem, and it's that there's a trolley coming down the tracks, barreling along at full speed, and it realizes its brakes are broken. And, and you see that there are five workmen farther down the track, and you can see that they are going to get killed, that the trolley is going to run over these five workmen. But it just so happens that you discover you're standing right next to a lever that can switch tracks, and on this other track, you see there's only one workman there. So the question is, will you switch the track over so that it kills only one person instead of five? So who will switch the track? Raise a hand. OK, great. Who won't switch the tracks? OK. I'm not even going to ask you guys why you want to switch the tracks. Of course, it's logical to switch the tracks, though. It's, so, so only one person gets killed instead of five. Now, here's, this, here's scenario number two. Same thing, the trolley is barreling down the tracks. You see five workmen, they're going to get killed because the brakes are out on the trolley. But this time, you're standing on a little bridge over the tracks. And you notice that standing right in front of you is an obese man. And if you push him off, you realize that his weight will be sufficient to stop the trolley and save the five workmen. <laughs> so who's going to push the fat man? And who's going to not push the man? OK. OK. So most people, in the first case, are going to switch the trolley so that one person gets killed instead of five. And in the second case, what I want you to notice is it's the same calculation. What I'm asking you is, will you sacrifice one life in exchange for five? But most of you won't do that now, which is interesting, right? It's the same math. But you guys won't push the guy on the bridge. So why not? So the neuroscientists. Joshua Green and Jonathan Cohen got interested in this question some years ago, and they did neuroimaging on people. They put them in the scanner while they did the trolley dilemma problem. And essentially what they found is this. There are areas of your brain that are involved in math problems that are saying, OK, well, what's 1 versus 5 and so on, and they make the calculation, and that's what happens. You have other networks in your brain that care about emotional issues. They're simulating things. They're seeing how things feel. And it turns out that these areas of the brain, so this is a slice of the brain right down the middle here. These tend to be more along the midline. And it turns out that in the second scenario where you're asking if you're going to push the guy, these areas come online. And that changes your decision making. In other words, emotions, how you feel about it, is a very important part in navigating the decision. The first one's just an easy math problem. The second one is an emotional problem, and it totally changes what you do. And in fact, this is what neuroimaging shows, but the idea that reason and emotion are always fighting with each other. That's a very old idea. So the Greeks had this metaphor that life is as though you are a charioteer, and you're being pulled along by the white horse of reason and the black horse of passion, and they're always trying to pull you off in opposite directions. And your job as the charioteer is to stay down the middle of the road. And it's hard, right, because you've got these two different pulls on you. OK, so this idea that emotions are involved in decision making is actually an old idea, and it's now supported by, by neuroscience. I just put this picture here as a, because there's a funny experiment where it turns out if you put people in a foul-smelling room, they will make harsher moral decisions. <laughs> and this just illustrates this conflation between how you feel about things, your emotions, and what you think is right and wrong. So it's a very important part of how we navigate our decision making in life. And you would not want to live in a world where everybody's like Mr. Spock and doesn't have this emotions, right? Because everybody would just push the fat guy off the bridge, and that would be the end of it. But instead, we use this to steer the sorts of decisions we make. If it feels wrong, we try not to do it. So the question is, what happens with something like this? This is a photograph from World War II. This is a German soldier who's about to execute a mother who's holding her child against her. And um, there are several things to note about this photograph here. First of all, the, the fact that he's about to do this in front of a cameraman suggests he's got a diminished emotional reactivity to this situation. He's not distressed by the situation. There's also a notion of compartmentalization going on here, because this photograph he actually mailed back to his family. So he's got a family. He cares about his wife and child. And he sends them a picture of executing somebody else's family. 
So there's this notion where he can take these ideas that are very different and compartmentalize them. So the, the neurosurgeon Yitzhak Fried uh, in the late 90s started thinking about this a lot, and he said, you know, when, when you look across all these different events in the world, you find this kind of behavior everywhere where people just, it's like they, they lose their normal brain function and become somebody different. They act very differently. And he said, when you look at the signs and symptoms, it's almost like there's a syndrome going on here. So he named this syndrome E, and he said there are very particular signs and symptoms that you would look for, just like you would look for coughing and fever with pneumonia. You look for particular things that characterize people behaving like this. So there's this, dim this diminished emotional reactivity, this ability to do these repetitive acts of violence. People maybe start off having a little bit of a hard time with it and very rapidly desensitize. It doesn't bother them anymore. There's, there's this hyper arousal, or as the Germans call it, Rausch, where it's this feeling of elation in doing these acts. Group contagion, which is a very important one, which I'll come back to. And the issue is, you know, everybody's doing it and it catches on and spreads. Um, compartmentalization I mentioned, where somebody can care about their own family, let's say, and yet at the same time do this sort of thing to other family. And the interesting thing from a neuroscience point of view is that things like language and memory and problem solving, those are working just fine. Those are completely intact. So that's a clue into what's happening under the hood. And what's happening under the hood in the case of syndrome E is something like this. The emotional areas are, are short-circuited. They're not a part of the equation anymore. Those are now out of, they're now out of the equation. So it makes the soldiers in situations like this act just like the guy who's going to push the other guy off the bridge. In other words, their decision making is being steered by parts of their brain that can do logic and reasoning and memory and so on, but not the parts of the brain that normally navigate things. OK. And what this leads to is a moral disengagement. Um, what happens is people are like uh, you know, a car that's a neutral going down the hill. They just don't have these systems anymore that are telling them the right way to steer their morality and their action. Now, how do you study this in the laboratory? Well, there was a recent study where um, people were shown photographs of groups that either sort of counted as groups they admired or groups they felt were more outgroupy. And so here's how it went. Um, if you show people pictures of people they admire, Olympic athletes and hard workers and so on, various parts of the brain light up. But I want to draw your attention to this middle circle right here. That's an area called the medial prefrontal cortex. And that's involved in these emotional systems and is also involved in social cognition. Whenever you're dealing with another person as opposed to an object, that area is active. And it turns out that even if you show people photographs of groups they don't like, people they envy or people they pity, you still get medial prefrontal cortex activation. I'm sorry this is cut off here, but, but there's this red circle there. That's, you still get that active. In other words, people still see them as humans, even though they're outgroupy. But if you go even further along the spectrum of outgroup and show people pictures of people they feel disgusted by, that area turns off. It just doesn't come online. And what that means is that they're viewing these people that they're, they're viewing it exactly like they do objects. Because when you show people objects, that area doesn't come online. It always comes online when you're looking at humans, except for really outgroup humans. It just doesn't come online anymore. So when we talk about dehumanization, what we're really talking about is that area of the brain not coming online. That part of the system is just out of the equation now. And now when you're making moral decisions about people who are very much in your outgroup, that part's not steering your behavior. And it turns out that with psychopaths, there are many things wrong with their brain. There um, are essentially congenital problems in their brain. But one of the issues going on is exactly this, where they don't have these areas emotionally steering their behavior. And so they are capable of doing things because they don't care about you. They can't simulate what it's like to be you. They don't have the emotional feeling that's steering around their sorts of decisions. And this is what happens when groups dehumanize their neighbors. So here's a group of German uh, citizens and soldiers uh, having their Jewish neighbors scrub the pavement in front of them. And they're having, they're having a great time laughing here. And what's happening is that because of the social context that allows syndrome E to happen, and this is what I'll talk about in a moment, is, this, is how it happens socially, 
these areas are no longer online. And so these are not like humans to them anymore. And of course, this typifies this sort of situation. Here's a quotation from a Japanese general during the uh, invasion of China. He said, well, it's because we thought of them as things, not as people like us. Here's a quotation from a woman in, in Rwanda who orchestrated the killing of, of thousands of Tutsi. She said, we thought of them as nothing more than insects or cockroaches. Um, here's from an American sergeant stationed in Iraq. He says, you just sort of try to block out the fact that they're human beings and you see them as enemies. So this typifies across place and time this notion of dehumanization, of turning off the parts of your brain that allow you to understand what it's like to be somebody else.